Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Vivian Gornitz, and I will be talking today about the impacts of sea level rise on uh, coastal urban areas, uh, with a particular emphasis on New York City because uh, I'm part of a, a group that has been studying uh, the climate impacts for the city uh, for the last couple of years. And um, to uh, introduce the topic, sea level has been rising globally, at least since the late um, 19th century. And so here we have a plot of, of the global sea level change uh, uh, covering uh, the end of the 19th through the early 20th, 21st century. And the um, total sea level rise over this period is about nine inches which uh, translates into about uh, a, a rise of approximately 1.7 uh, millimeters a year. And uh, more recently, however, sea level has been increasing even more so uh, as noted by the blue line. And here we see it in greater detail. Um, in uh, 1992, they launched a satellite altimeter which measures the height of the ocean uh, and, and the variations from year to year. And since that period, although there have been some years where the sea level is lower and others where it's been a bit higher, on the whole, it's been trending around three millimeters a year. So er, there's an apparent acceleration uh, since the early uh, 1990s. And to be uh, kept in mind, the uh, slide that we saw previously, uh, which starts in about 1880. Prior to that, during the uh, 19th century and perhaps even for many centuries before that, the uh, global sea level rise was only a, a few tenths of a millimeter a year. So it looks like the, um, the uh, global sea level change is sort of keeping pace in a sense with the global temperature rise. <laughs> anyway, um, now, this is just a, a slide which um, looks at the various causes of, of sea level change. And on this uh, schematic uh, drawing, there are two main changes that are climatically related. And one is the thermal expansion of ocean water as the air rises, so do, do the, uh, there's the temperature also increasing in the upper layers of the ocean. And as the water warms, it's also expanding upward, which raises sea level. And the warming air is also causing ice to melt on both the mountain glaciers and the ice sheets. And that water eventually makes its way to the ocean, also contributing to sea level rise. But the rise in sea level is not globally uniform. And there are many other uh, processes that may either uh, elevate or depress the, the sea level rise above that of the global average. And some of these are also indicated here. Uh, one of the most important are the um, vertical land motions that have a number of different causes. Here in New York City, uh, most of it is due to glacial isostatic adjustment. And what that means is that during the periods of ice ages, the, uh, where the ice sheets were, uh, for example, the last ice age, they were covering most of Canada and Northern United States and also uh, parts of Europe and in uh, British Isles, it's Fenoscandia. And where the load of ice is, is the heaviest, the land is depressed under the weight of that ice. Uh, at the periphery of the ice sheet, on the other hand, the land bulges upward. When the ice melts and retreats and disappears, these ice sheets that once covered the continents, uh, they, uh, the land that was once under the ice, like Canada or Scandinavia, now are rising, uh, whereas the land that was to the south of the uh, edge of the ice sheet is sinking. And that's what's happening here on, on the East Coast from, from New York City approximately down to um, the Chesapeake Bay area, which, which is sinking the most. 
due to the isostatic adjustment. But in addition to that, you may have land motions due to geologic reasons, plate tectonics, uh, neotectonism, uh, areas that are earthquake prone, like what they call the uh, Pacific Rim of Fire all around the Pacific Ocean, uh, where you have uh, one plate diving under another. And, and so there you have uh, also land motions that are connected with these um, geologic forces. And you could also have uh, a sinking, land sinking or land subsidence due to extraction of underground fluids like groundwater being the most common, but also in some areas like uh, Louisiana in the Mississippi Delta, you know, where they're extracting oil and gas. And that's also contributing to, the, to land sinking. And another um, um, process is what, what they call land water storage. Um, and the most important processes involved would be what they call groundwater mining, which simply means you're extracting groundwater faster than it can be replenished by rainfall. And also uh, the impoundment or trapping of water in reservoirs behind dam. And some of these other processes like urban runoff, deforestation and so on are just minor, uh, but, but the first two were the most important um, um, factors affecting the uh, land uh, water. Um, and that also affects sea level because ultimately uh, if let's say um, groundwater mining exceeds imp impoundment in reservoirs that will add water to the ocean and sea level will rise or vice versa. Now, um, one major consequence of, of a rising sea level is the flooding uh, due to uh, severe coastal storms. And here you see the, the flooding in, uh, after Hurricane Harvey in, in large parts of Texas. Now, not all of this was due to coastal uh, storm surge as such, but also because of the uh, torrential downpours that occurred during that particular hurricane. And uh, these severe storms can also generate high water and, uh, and wave action that can lead to coastal erosion and shoreline uh, retreat. And in general, sea level rise will exacerbate the effects of these storms uh, because the base ocean level uh, is higher than it would have been formerly. So you have that in addition to whatever the storm surge uh, is produced. Now here you have Hurricane Sandy, which affected uh, the New Jersey and, and New York City uh, shoreline. Uh, in figure A, you see waves crashing against the seawall in Brooklyn. Luckily, uh, the area that's underwater there was a park and the, and the buildings are further back. So uh, that area, although was underwater, uh, I think what you see sticking out, uh, you may see the tops of uh, some park benches sticking out there. And uh, that's the Verrazano Bridge uh, in the background. Uh, in B, you see a, uh, a coastal barrier island community in New Jersey, Seaside Heights, that was very badly flooded during Sandy. And barrier islands in general are extremely vulnerable to um, coastal storms, be they hurricanes or, or even severe um, nor'easters. And this is an example of, of, of what happened. Uh, it, looking more closely into the New York City area, uh, uh, C uh, shows what a cascading into the World Trade Center site, which was uh, under construction at the time. And similarly, uh, the entrance to the path trains that connect Hoboken un underwater, you know, across the uh, Hudson River to New York City. And then the water is just streaming in there. Uh, actually, Hurricane Sandy was the worst storm, not only in the last, well, this slide says 76 by now, it's 80 years, because the oldest storm on the list 
the Long Island Express was a hurricane uh, that hit uh, Long Island and um, southern New England in uh, 1938. However, historical records show that Hurricane Sandy was actually, or most likely, the, the worst or the, the highest degree of storm flooding in 300 years. Because there was a severe hurricane in 1821, uh, and, and this surpassed, uh, the, the, the water level surpassed it, and probably aided and abetted by the fact that sea level has risen about a foot and a half since the mid uh, eight, eighteen uh, uh, hundreds, and uh, and then there was also another uh, less well documented storm in the late eighteenth um, uh, century. And uh, New York City has undergone historic sea level rise. Uh, the, the city has one of the oldest tide gauges in the country, uh, goes back to eighteen fifty six, and so. It's been averaging about 2.8 uh, millimeters a year over this time period. Now, uh, recently our group, we, the uh, NPCC is a New York panel on climate change. And since about um, 2010, we've issued a number of reports uh, the most recent being the one uh, from uh, 2019, actually uh, ju just released to the public about a month ago. And uh, the uh, sea level projections that were, that this group, you know, of um, science experts from, it's multidisciplinary and multi-institutional group uh, of um, climate experts and also people that are well-versed in economics and sociology and, and insurance and so forth. And we worked very closely with New York City, um, communicating with them and interacting to uh, develop uh, uh, the um, needs that, that, that the city has uh, in, in, in planning for the future. And th these are the sea level uh, projections uh, the first four columns of the report that we uh, prepared by uh, 2015. And this uh, forms the scientific basis, is part of the scientific basis for New York City resiliency planning. And so it was based on um, two um, climate change scenarios that were used by the IPCC. It's called uh, our uh, CP uh, 4.5 and uh, RCP 8.5. We also used uh, a number of uh, climate uh, projections for the oceanic um, components and also the, um, for the ice sheets and, and uh, glaciers. We also uh, based it on literature survey and expert um, elicitation uh, studies. And so we created a model-based uh, distribution that was divided into um, these percentiles. The low percentiles is the uh, up to the 10th, and the middle range uh, goes from about the 25th to the 75th, whereas the high estimate was the 90th uh, uh, percentile. And we divided it up into uh, these time periods, the 2020s, 2050s, and 2080s. And the numbers that you see in black are in inches. The ones under them in blue are in meters. Um, so basically, as you look down uh, the chart, obviously the sea level is continuing to rise. Uh, up to about 2100, we end the uh, uh, the um, projection in in the year 2100. But um, as will be noted at some point, the the sea level story is not over in 2100. It continues beyond that. So this is just the beginning. So at any case, looking at the high end, uh, the 90th percentile. Uh, by the 2080s, we're close to about one and a half meters of sea level rise. And by the end of the century, 
uh, just below two meters. And this uh, is, uh, we are more recently looking at an even more extreme case. It's very low probability, maybe just a, f a few percent uh, possible by the end of the century, maybe even less. Um, and it's based on the fact that the ice sheets have been uh, losing ice much more rapidly than we realized even as recently as 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, you know, things are changing much more rapidly than we would have expected. And we are looking at a number of, of studies uh, that suggest that sea level in the uh, future <clears throat> could be even higher. <clears throat> well, I need some water. And in this, we call this extreme case of this very high upper bound but very low probability scenario, we call it ARIM. Um, the, this is the Antarctic Rapid Ice Melt Scenario, um, based on some studies that suggest that there may be some destabilizing processes uh, most likely to hit the West Antarctic ice sheet um, late in the century uh, under high emission scenarios. Think RCP uh, 8.5, uh, close to what, what is a business as usual scenario if nothing's being done to curb our, our uh, carbon uh, emissions. And, under, and there are these three uh, instabilities that, that could kick in. One is a marine ice sheet instability because a lot of the ice uh, sheet, uh, at least the edges of the ice sheet uh, on the West Antarctic ice sheet are sitting uh, on slopes that are tilting landward in toward the center of the ice sheet. And uh, they terminate in, in, in these ice streams that terminate in basically in fjords that um, enter the ocean. And, and then, then you have these fringing ice shelves that, that are just floating ice that are just extensions of the ice sheet. And there's warmer water that's coming in from, the, um, uh, from beneath that is eating away at the bottom of, of these ice shelves and weakening them. And it may reach a point where they break apart like what already happened um, on the Antarctic, uh, Antarctic Peninsula, which, which is that peninsula sticking out of Antarctica that is extending further north and hence is warmer, uh, somewhat warmer than the rest of the continent. Anyway, that may be just a preview of what might be happening on some of the ice shelves in uh, the West Antarctic ice sheet. That was one of the in instabilities. Another is that, um, you know, during the warm season, uh, the surface may start melting and, and water accumulating in pools on the surface, which is already happening on the Greenland ice sheet, by the way, every summer. And there are these fractures <clears throat> and crev crevasses uh, beneath these, um, these uh, pools that water can just stream into. And then uh, the pressure of the water, and then as it freezes and thaws, it just wedges them apart until these fractures or fissures uh, extend all the way down to the base. And that kind of weakens the, the uh, ice and pieces crack off. Anyway, so that's one, that's a hydrofracturing instability. Then you have another one that has been proposed, but hasn't really been uh, observed. And we don't really know um, how likely that is, uh, is called the ice cliff, uh, marine ice cliff instability, you know, where the uh, Antarctic ice sheet uh, just ends uh, against the ocean. You know, you have these big cliffs uh, because the ice sheet is rather thick. And, and so you do have some um, 
crevasses and stuff at the edge. And so large, if the cliff is high enough, you know, it's, uh, there's an inherent instability and, and, you know, some of these ice slabs just going to break off. But anyway, as I say, that particular um, instability hasn't really been tested. It's been proposed, and this is what was incorporated into a certain model that that went into the Aram scenario. So in a sense, you can look at it as a real extreme case. And so these are the results, you know, with that assumption in mind, are shown with the, the other um, uh, factors contributing to sea level remaining constant. It's only um, the Antarctic uh, that has changed uh, because, uh, based on these instabilities. And, and so those numbers are shown uh, in the very uh, rightmost column, um, starting in the 2080s and, and 2100, where the uh, in 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 this very low likelihood situation, sea level could climb as much as two meters by the 2080s, and <laughs> just under three by by the end of the century. But as I say, to be kept in mind, this is still a preliminary controversial uh, model and uh, these results are just to be seen as an exploration of a possible future. Uh, the other results shown in, in uh, the first four columns are the, the ones that the city is, is relying on uh, in its planning. And this just goes to show what could happen uh, as a consequence of sea level rise in, in, in the event of major coastal storms. And uh, we are now looking at a map of the city. And the uh, area in purple is the 100-year flood zone. In other words, this is the area that could be flooded by a storm that has a likelihood of occurrence in uh, one in a hundred um, and uh, it's uh, this was uh, based on on the FEMA uh, mapping uh, the flood insurance maps uh, that are prepared for various parts of the country this is uh, their preliminary map for New York City that's the area in purple to be noted the uh, areas of uh, the southern Brooklyn and Queens and, and the um, peninsula, the Rockaway Peninsula, are the most heavily at risk, including also these areas in purple on Staten Island, other parts of the city also. Now, let's add sea level rise, and we're not looking at the effect of changes in the actual storm intensity, which in turn could change in the future. There is a, a um, possibility that tropical storms will become stronger, not necessarily more frequent, but stronger. And if you get more hurricane cat category five storms, some of them could work their way up north, even as far as New York City, because we have been struck by hurricanes in the past as that uh, flood history has shown. And, you know, they may be uh, a good strong category three or four by the time we, uh, by the time the storm arrives in this area. That's, you know, in looking into the future. But we haven't looked at that uh, aspect. We're just looking at what happens if you add a certain amount of sea level rise on top of the 100 year flood. And uh, so those are shown in the various colors, uh, the uh, 2020s. And this is based on the uh, earlier study, the 2015 study, which is still the official record for New York City. The, the 2020s are shown in, in pale green, uh, the 2050s, the 30-inch uh, sea level rise in a darker shade of green, and, and the, the yellow and red represent areas that could be flooded in the um, toward the end of the uh, century. Looking more closely now at the at the hundred year flood zone, we now look at. Uh, did I skip a? Yeah, I, I think I skipped a, fly, a slide. This is basically a repeat of the same slide, but we're now adding on 
the, the two extreme um, uh, Aram scenarios for the 2080s and, and the 2100 shown in the orange and, and the dark red um, zones on the uh, out, uh, inland fringes of the uh, map. And again, the areas most affected are in southern Brooklyn and Queens with small patches in other parts of the city. And these are just to be shown, you know, as, as an indication of, of what could happen. They're not meant to be used for planning or anything like that. And here we ha zoom in on, on the Jamaica Bay area, which is one of the areas most likely to be hardest hit. Again, the purple is the, the FEMA. Uh, this uh, is a more updated version of the FEMA 100-year uh, flood map um, from 20. Uh, 15 rather than uh, 2013. Anyway, we also add in the Aram scenarios that you can see on the upper fringes. And something new that has been added, we're now looking at monthly tidal floods, the spring tides. Um, and these occur more frequently than, than a hundred year flood. I mean, these occur every month. And this is again in the Jamaica Bay area. We look at the uh, scenarios from the, and we're looking at the monthly high, high water uh, mark. And we're looking at the present day um, as, as I show, and which is very, very, um, some areas, for example, in the middle of Jamaica Bay, Get, get flooded almost monthly. And there is a small community right there in the middle uh, of the bay called Broad Channel. And so there are people living there and also on the edges, you know, the, the northern edges of the, of the bay. So, and then as you can see, some of these areas, uh, the, they expand as, as sea level rises, the area that will experience tidal flooding uh, will will grow and include notice uh, JFK by the you know in the Aram scenario by the end of the uh, century uh, the airport would be flooded on a monthly basis so the areas again in that uh, tan and and the dark red are are the ones that are going to you know uh, in the worst case scenario the Aram scenario would you know, would experience uh, additional tidal flooding. Now, the city is, is taking active measures to ensure coastal resilience. And this includes uh, high resolution LIDAR mapping and uh, a flood hazard mapping tool where it uses the, uh, the official uh, NPCC 2015 sea level rise data and the, the FEMA firm 100 year flood maps and looks at it, you know, people can zoom in on their particular neighborhood or area to see what areas uh, might be flooded. Another uh, steps the city is taking is to strengthen its coastal defenses it's uh, reinforcing raising seawalls, building more dikes, levees, and, and floodgates. And it's also strengthened its building code uh, so that people living in a flood zone need to um, uh, construct flood resilient building, really improve the uh, flood resistance of their, or of their building and raise the freeboard. In other words, they have to be higher, somewhat higher than the, the 100 year flood level. And in the city itself, many of the uh, um, electrical and, and uh, water things that, that have been in basements typically have, you know, like boilers and so on. In many um, of the most high risk neighborhoods, these are being raised. Uh, to, to, the, to a higher uh, floor uh, so that if that area is flooded in the future, um, it won't affect the power as badly as it did during Hurricane Sandy. 
and, and some of the other measures, and we'll show slides of this, we'll um, create soft edges. In other words, we're working, working with, uh, with nature to uh, lessen the impact of, of waves and tides, and, and we'll see examples of that. And the city has really made progress in lining the waterfront with parks as buffer zones, and, and, and they're really uh, great as recreation areas because they have area, you know, old piers are being repurposed for um, sporting activities, outdoor concerts in the summer, and so on. And we're restoring the, the wetlands in Jamaica Bay and uh, also other things that, that are being done elsewhere, say on Long Island or in New Jersey, the Army Corps of Engineers is widening and raising the beaches and, and revegetating beach dunes. And so these are examples of some of the coastal defenses. We call them hard because they're basically engineering structures. And, and typically there are things like sea walls um, and jetties, which, which protect inlets so that boats can go in and out. And then, you know, where you have a urbanized area, you can create these breakwaters, both attached to the land or even offshore a bit. And those will dampen and, and lessen the incoming waves. And, but it won't necessarily completely uh, remove the effect of a very high uh, storm surge. It might somewhat reduce the effect in the immediate vicinity, but if you have an open area that's unprotected, the water works its way around it. And, and then you also have uh, areas where you have a series of groins. These are just, you know, uh, just piles of rocks that are sticking out into the ocean that, that basically uh, are meant to lessen coastal erosion, but in some cases it actually uh, uh, reinforces or makes the erosion worse. Because you have this phenomenon called longshore drift, basically it just means that this, there's always some sort of uh, ocean current that moves more or less parallel to the shore and it moves sand around. And so what happens is that the sand accumulates against one of those groins or jetties, and then that starves the sand further upstream or you know, along the drift, the direction of the drift. And they may get around some of that by uh, better designing where exactly they put these groins or jetties. And also in some of the newer structures, uh, I think they have openings underground so that the sand can move along with the water and it's not blocked up against a, a barrier. Here's an example of a flood barrier in Holland. It's the Maesland barrier, uh, which uh, in a normal weather, in a nice sunny day, as in the photo, um, the uh, barrier, and I think there's one on the other side of the river as well, is emplaced on land. And then when a, when a major storm is coming, a major storm surge alert, these things swing into position and act as a barrier across the, the river. And I think that there's also an extension um, that uh, of the uh, outer edge of that barrier that goes down uh, when the, when the uh, barrier swings over the water. And this uh, is meant to protect Rotterdam, which is one of the biggest ports, if not the major port in Europe, um, from, from severe storms and flooding. And the Dutch are very, very sensitive to the issue of sea level rise because much of their country is below sea level and they have had a long history of flooding by storms and so they've had a long experience in building dikes and levees and, and other storm protection uh, measures. And uh, they are very forward-looking into many different modes of 
of protection, not just these uh, engineering structures, but also working with nature. This is an example of a soft coastal defense um, on the um, shore uh, in Holland, uh, where you see the beach is nice and wide, and a lot of that is just sand that had been brought in to widen the beach, and then the dunes have been raised, and there's a lot of replanting going on. And on the, not shown in the photo, more toward the land, you have settled areas that are behind the levee. Um, there's a whole communities that are behind that levee. Um, and there's a, there's a road, you know, at the edge of the fence. I was just walking along and took the picture there when I, I was in Holland a number of years ago. And then this is another example of, of how this city, it's a coastal city called Schwenningen, um, which is near Delft, not far from that area, uh, where you see the, the houses on top, of, and they're on top of a levee. So it's multi-use. They're expanding the beach. It's still under construction. And obviously they've raised the levee. And, and as you can see, it's still a site under construction. By now it's probably finished. And when it's done, part of it will be a beach, part of it will be a park, and, and um, there will be a roadway on top. And, uh, you know, it'll be a very um, enjoyable use that, that, you know, people can live in an area, feel fairly protected because, you know, the Dutch plan ahead. They, they look at certain parts of their coast that's very vulnerable to erosion and flooding. They look toward the, not the 100-year storm or the 500-year storm, the 10,000, one in 10,000 years, like from now to the end of the last ice age. Anyway, and, and elsewhere, uh, where it's less populated, they, they take what the one in 4,000 year storm into consideration. So they really think long-term. And here's an ex another example of working with nature, the green infrastructure. This is in Brooklyn Bridge Park uh, along the East River. And here you see a number of things. You see the riprap or pile of stones against the the uh, shore, you see the trees on, on the shore, and that's actually part of a park. It's a nice park that's been reclaimed uh, from old piers and, and, and abandoned factories and replanting of the coastal wetlands and piles of, of wood and even stones. And this is meant to dampen or lessen a wave energy of an incoming uh, storm surge. And, and the uh, East River, which, this, which is what you're looking at, Manhattan being on the left side, it's not in view here, has very strong tides, uh, even on a normal day. The, this tides are very, very strong. There's strong currents that change all the time. And so you can imagine with a major storm surge as in in uh, during Hurricane Sandy, uh, you can imagine how the water just surged up there because that the part of the ferocity and damage of that storm was due to the fact that it happened to coincide with high tide at a time of full moon where the tides are extra high to begin with. So it was just an unfortunate combination of uh, various um, oceanographic and meteorological factors that made that storm so, uh, so terrible, as far, particularly in the New Jersey and, and New York areas. And here's another example of, of um, the soft uh, structures. Here we're re, uh, restoring the natural wetlands uh, in Jamaica Bay, uh, which were severely degraded during the 20th century uh, in part due to pollution, in part due to uh, dredging. You know, at one point they wanted to uh, open the bay to major shipping and things like that. That was earlier in the in the century. And uh, anyway, so now we're we're taking these restorative measures, and and this is this is just an illustration of of that under uh, in in progress. 
And here's an, a planned area for the Manhattan side, uh, the, the Lower East Side of Manhattan along the um, East uh, River. And uh, there we are seeing a proposed extension of the land, new landfill, that will be uh, come parks and recreation areas and will act as a buffer zone uh, to protect uh, the heavy, um, high density um, buildings and everything, you know, the largely populated area um, landward of it. So how do we live with a rising sea level? Even although this focused on New York City, <clears throat> a lot of what I said was true for many of the major cities throughout the world, major coastal cities. And we can expect globally up to about a meter of sea level rise. And locally, as we saw here in New York City, it could be even higher by the end of the century. And, and I mentioned earlier <clears throat> that sea level rise continues beyond 2100, largely because once you put all that atmospheric uh, uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, particularly CO2, uh, CO2 has a very long lifespan in the atmosphere. And once it's there, it's hard to get rid of. It dissipates very slowly. And so therefore the earth remains warmer, more thermal expansion can occur because the, the um, heat also penetrates into the ocean and goes deeper with time and, and therefore the thermal expansion uh, continues uh, and that contributes to sea level rise. And similarly, the ice sheets will melt not only because of the atmospheric uh, temperatures being higher, but also because of the ocean waters that will lap up against the um, ice uh, shelves and, and uh, uh, erode them from beneath, weakening them and, and making them more susceptible to cracking and breaking apart. And when that happens, uh, these ice shelves act as a kind of break uh, for the ice streams that are um, entering the ocean. And so that uh, enables the ice to accelerate and eventually once it reaches the ocean and floats and so on, it will contribute to a sea level rise. And furthermore, with a higher sea level, um, you will have greater degrees of, of uh, land inundation during major coastal storms. And two other th things that I didn't really mention is the intrusion of salt water into uh, coastal aquifers and coastal wetlands losses. And uh, so those are other uh, things that would uh, be affected by, by a much higher sea level. Now, this, the coastal cities can prepare by strengthening and improving their existing coastal storm emergency preparations. <laughs> and <clears throat> as we showed for New York and Holland, to increase the coastal defenses, including both the hard engineered structures as well as the soft uh, natural protection um, methods such as raising dunes, revegetating dunes and wetlands. And, and creating these park uh, buffer zones. And while the city, uh, New York in particular, and other cities too, are strengthening building codes, one thing that uh, I feel is a bit amiss is that we haven't done enough about revising our land use zoning. And this also applies to all the heavy construction that's going on or has gone on uh, creating these wall-to-wall -wall condominiums on the uh, barrier islands. The coastal barrier islands are the most vulnerable, even without sea level rise, to uh, major storms and, and, and erosion and, and uh, flooding and so forth. And in many of the areas, you know, from New Jersey all the way to Florida and similarly along 
the Gulf Coast are heavily built up, not just with with the little summer cottages the way they were maybe 40, 50 years ago, but now high rise condominiums and hotels and this and that. And I think that, that land use zoning should be uh, applied to these high risk areas because not only are they vulnerable to current storm activity, but also uh, to uh, the sea level rise in combination with future storms. And an other alternatives that we really haven't discussed that much are to uh, create interesting urban designs. The Dutch uh, in particular and Germans and some other uh, countries and even uh, occasionally in certain parts of the States, you have uh, things like floating neighborhoods where people live on buildings that rise and fall with the tides. I actually saw such a, a neighborhood, a very nice place, but it's only a very small community. And this was in Victoria, British Columbia. And people live on houseboats uh, in many parts of the world. Uh, certainly in Holland also, I've seen it in Seattle and Sausalito in California. And uh, even here in the city, there, there were some uh, people living on houseboats and some of the marinas here. And also in canals, you know, like, uh, especially in Holland, which has a lot of canals, uh, they, they are people that have converted barges to uh, living quarters. <laughs> and it looks very colorful and all that. But, you know, it's, it is an option uh, that, that can happen, you know, when areas are flooded, but people still want to remain there. Uh, the, these are some of the things that, that they could still do. But in a last resort, if sea level does rise more than several meters, many uh, of the most vulnerable neighborhoods may have to uh, uh, move landward. And, and we call that managed relocation because nobody likes the idea of coastal retreat. <laughs> but that I, I think is sort of an ultimate uh, uh, last resort. Hopefully we don't need to do that for many centuries to come. All right. Thank you, Vivian. Oh. Let's check to see if we have any questions. Uh, Hi, Vivian, this is David. So I have two questions. One is global and speculative, and the other is local and practical. <laughs> For the global speculative one, under the Aram scenario, or even just in general, people have raised the issue of, you know, sort of in a conceptual idea of West Antarctic ice sheets sliding into the sea mm -hmm. or breaking off. And the real question is, and it's speculative, obviously, if such a thing were to happen or start to happen, how fast would that be? And would there be enough time for a number of the uh, activities you mentioned in, in, uh, in response to sea level rise, would they be able to take place? Would that be a, a sudden and dramatic sea level rise? Well, uh, there was one model that, that we made use of uh, to a large extent for this Aram scenario, and that was proposed by De Canto and Pollard in 2016. And I think that they came up with something like a, a, a meter or, or some more from an, from an Arctic alone by the end of the century. But, but I think it's a very low probability that such a scenario will come to be. And I've just read a, a, or looked at a couple of very recent papers that question this ice cliff instability and uh, the extent to which this hydro fracturing mechanism would, would break the shelves apart. Um, the ice shelves, that is. And, but the marine ice sheet instability, I think, is still a valid possibility. I mean, uh, it was uh, several scientists already proposed that, that, that it might already be occurring on, on some of the um, um, glaciers uh, on the West Antarctic ice sheet. So that, that is, I think, a more likely possibility. But whether it goes to a meter or more by the two, that, that I think is very unlikely. But I think that maybe in several centuries or more, 
I mean, these things could very well start happening. So you think it would be a gradual process, not a sort of sudden sea level rise process? Yeah, yeah, but gradual, but increasing, increasing is no matter what model you look at, even the more modest ones, beyond the 2050s, they all seem to be rising exponentially. It's just a question of how high, you know, and how soon a given area will be flooded. And the second question, which is local and practical, uh, this is being recorded um, and, and broadcast through the auspices of Columbia University. And we know that Columbia is building a new campus north of their current campus, which is sort of alongside the Hudson River. Right. What are they doing to prepare for something of this nature that might impact their, their, uh, their real estate? Yeah, well, that's a very good question, and I don't think they really have looked at it very well because you know the the reports that our group is putting out are in the public domain. They're on on uh, the New York City website and also the New York Academy of Sciences. So the material is out there. I mean, I don't know. They 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 just uh, close their eyes to it, I guess. But I don't know if if they have taken any specific actions. In, in making their buildings particularly flood resilient or not. Thank you. All right. So thanks everybody again for joining. Thank you, Vivian, for a wonderful talk. Well, thank you. <laughs> and we'll see you um, next month. Thanks, mm -hmm. everyone. Okay, no questions? Oh, anybody attending? I mean, yeah, there, there were um, 20 people. Is that um, about average? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and